guys, it's Hannah and this is Performance Talk and today I'm going to talk about How to Kill a Rockstar by Tiffany De Bartolo. I'm going to start off this review with something that I don't think I've actually said before unless I was talking about this book. Best descriptions I've ever read. I can go on for days, absolutely just days. My past two months of poetry favorites for the month have been just things from this book and the beautiful descriptions because I could actually be here all day just saying, oh my god, that was beautifully put. That was everything about this book. Seriously? One particular thing that has stuck with me is the way that she described someone's eyes and she said they were like liquid leather. Ugh. Sure, this book is about a rock star of sorts, but it's really not the focus. It's like the backdrop to the story, kind of like how I tried to explain the Bronze Horseman and the history and the war and everything being very important, but again, being more of the backdrop and the characters, you know, the ones that are really moving the story along. So our two characters, Eliza Callum and Paul Hudson. I'm already going to get off track and say that Paul Hudson is one of the, my favorite characters to have read from his perspective, ever, okay? This has only happened one other time that I've even mentioned that this is one of my favorite characters I've ever read. And again, that was with The Bronze Horseman, which is my favorite book. Says a lot here. Back to Eliza and Paul now. To kind of go along with what the reviews have already said of this book, because there are only so many ways to say that this book was wonderful and edgy and raw and honest and funny. I'm going to kind of continue in that, more so on just the honesty points of this. The quotes that I talk about that I say are beautiful. Yes, the descriptions are just wonderfully beautiful. I often find like these bigger than life kind of moments are really what hit home. And I'm going to give you one example. I was alone in ways people aren't supposed to be alone. And sure, I could have stayed where I was, continued working my nowhere job, living in my nowhere apartment, eventually marry some nowhere man, have a few kids, and anthracize myself with the provincial monotony like most of my peers had done. And before I knew it, I'd be six feet under. I wanted more, and I had hope. Do you see what I mean when I say this woman's like a mad writing genius? Synopsis time though, because I have to do that, right? I can't just sit here and gush. That's not a thing. Make I don't know what's gonna happen. Giving a summary to this book is almost pointless because I can't. <laughs> I have a very hard time with describing books that I fell in love with. From a young age, Eliza has been just drawn to music, and she really found this one song in particular that saved her life, and it is called The Day I Became a Ghost by Doug Blackman, I believe. And we start off the story with her talking with Doug Blackman, and her kind of explaining that her soul was just withering, and how this freaking song just meant so much to her. Like, this story revolves around music, just the freaking way that she describes music. I believe at one point she says, uh, it's like metal electricity on my tongue. Eliza moves to New York. Makes sense, you know, following that last quote. She moves in with her brother and his girlfriend, and then he also has another roommate who she's going to be sharing, like, the second unit type of thing with. And her roommate is Paul, a musician in the band Banana Fish. Love the weird name. Eliza and Paul really share this love of music, and they have this extreme reverence for it. And Paul, goddamn Paul, it makes me want to use goddamn as an adjective for everything. <laughs> He's a really captivating character. His pancreas thing to the pop pagans and how he just, he hates what is so mainstream and he feels like it's selling out. And I just appreciate him as a character. I felt like I really understood what he was saying and I kind of felt a lot of the same things he felt. I mean, totally different levels, but that good music doesn't really get appreciated. And that is still true today. I believe this book was written in 2005, based in 2000 through 2002. I think it's a two-year period that it's based between. And so when Banana Fish gets signed with this big label, Paul is kind of on his way to stardom. And there are a lot of problems that way because he doesn't want to sell out. He wants his music to be his and there's a lot of conflict with this. The characters were really well developed. Like I said, I adore Paul and I like I loved Eliza because we got to read through Paul's perspective and I think that is a very big reason why I liked her because he made me like her because oh her falcon eyes looking up at the sky. To finish off the non-spoiler section, I'm going to read you one of my favorite quotes from this book. I say one of because I can't decide which is my favorite. For what it's worth, I think happiness is a fleeting condition, not a goddamn state of mind. I've learned that if you chase after moments of bliss here and there, 
Sometimes those moments will sustain you through the shit. Personally, I don't like inherently happy people. I don't trust them. I think there's something seriously wrong with anyone who's not at least a little let down by this world. This is why I love Paul Hudson. That. But I am going to begin talking about the spoilers of the book. I really want to get at the ending. Not even necessarily the ending, but the, the stuff right before the ending. Like the beginning of part three into part two. That's really what I want to talk about. That was me being as vague as I humanly can. So seriously, if this book interests you in the least, do not watch this because it will ruin the ending for you. And I can't go, I'm not even going to go into it. So just seriously, if you're thinking about reading it, don't watch this. Just maybe rewatch the first part. And I don't, I don't know, just go do something. Go be productive. So I will see you guys later next month, Bookworms Talk. For those of you who have not read this, come back when you have read it. Seriously, please. Must read top 10 favorites. I'm saying it now. So I'll see you later. Bye. End of part two, beginning of part three. I normally do this in chronological order, but this is just, it's been burning inside of me. I was bawling. I really thought that this book was going to end in, on a more bitter note. So I was 100% convinced that Paul would be dead and just that would be it. I even convinced myself that that one chapter where he was looking in on like the funeral type of memorial thing? Anyway, the thing that it was at the Rings of Saturn, I was convinced, oh, okay, we're writing from a ghost's perspective. I did not believe, or nor did I really want to give myself that hope that my favorite character was alive. I just didn't want to go there because I really didn't think it was going to be a reality. I thought I'm reading into this. This is not how it's meant to, I don't, I don't know. I convinced myself. That being said, I think that there are quite a few other options that, um, the situation could have been handled. He wanted that freedom. He didn't want to be held down by the Winkles. And it was like this, you know, new way to start over. Like, why fake your death? Why? That was just cruel. And whether or not he really believed that Eliza, I don't know, cared for him in any way, that was just cruel. And I just, I don't know. I really feel like there could have been a thousand different ways to end it. But after I kind of accepted that, I was... It was fine. I'm not really going to be that critical. If he was dead and that was just it in the end, I probably would feel exactly the same way, which sounds weird because I've been talking about how much I really do like this character. I think it would have fit either way, honestly. I don't know, my rambling bit about that's over. I just think it could have been done a couple different ways, though I'm not complaining about the ending because I'm super happy that he's alive. I gushed long enough about descriptions, so I'm gonna find a couple that I love and I'm going to read them to you because I've been wanting to do this for a very long time. It took me a while to finish this book. I got to about like the 70% mark and then I stopped because I was really irritated by Eliza. And I think we got a little less, I don't feel like that was grammatically correct. I feel like there were less of Paul's chapters, which truth be told, I will read anything from his perspective if it's boring because I feel like he really has this distinct voice as a character, like from the different perspectives, which I find that is very hard to do in my own writing because I write from different perspectives, from a male and a female, and I feel like I finally got the hang of it, but in the beginning, man oh man, was it really difficult to create this distinct voice for this one character and then this other character and then make it really work. And I feel like it really, really, really worked with Paul. It did with Eliza, but I just, I love Paul's mind. I had a point. What was I doing? Descriptions. Dark sharp eyes that could be cut from granite. Bright green eyes speckled with amethyst. She gazed at the speakers like God was talking to her. I also really loved how Paul described Eliza's eyes as falcon eyes. The muggy July heat felt like a plastic bag wrapped around my head. Lines that ran down her face like a Manhattan bus map. Absorbing his words was like taking a drink of hot tea. They burned on the way down, but soothed my insides once they had time to cool off. That's just a couple. Again, could be here all day. I really loved the lingo of this book and the whole pop pagans and the winkles and I just, I loved how there was a specific name for everything and it made you really feel like you were in on the joke and really part of that story. Eliza has a extreme fear of flying. We remember why, it was because her parents had died in a plane crash. It was this freak thing and it was horrible and so she has that fear and her brother has that fear but not to the level that she has it and I mean he's able to get on a plane and he's okay but she is just in a panic which is understandable I myself am nervous about planes I've gotten better over the past couple years but I've been flying more often 
But man, let me tell you, I was ready to lose my cookies trying to get on a plane. So I really, really, really understood what she meant. And again, this is gonna make me sound like I have so many just like fears, but then Paul's fear was, you know, going in subways, like these underground things. And he had this moment when he said, I won't ride anything that goes underground. I'll be subterranean enough when I'm dead. And I agree with that as well, because I don't like the underground thing. I don't like the really far above ground thing. Like you could both potentially die. I actually think I'd be more afraid of subways than airplanes. I just am not around subways because Texas doesn't have those. And since we're kind of talking about airplanes, I am going to jump ahead and talk about 9-11 and how it was written in this story. I do pay attention to dates um, and location when we're in books and I kind of expected this to happen and truth be told, I was at an earlier point when I had that realization and I said, I really want to see how this happens. And I was just slowly crying throughout the entire thing. It was incredibly done. I really don't think it could have been done better. And I remember there was this one part where they were jumping out the windows of the building and she said, Paul, look, they're trying to fly. And I still got goosebumps just saying that and I remember it really vividly. I read that chapter um, probably two or three times just because I couldn't, I couldn't get over it. And they talked about death in this book a lot, suicide really, and it made a lot of sense later on when Paul committed suicide. I, I really believed it because it wasn't this random sudden thing, it was something that we had time to mull over. Another thing that I really loved that was this interwoven theme throughout the story is fate and destiny and Paul really talked about that. I myself am a very big believer in fate and destiny and I felt like there were these really incredible conversations with the differing views upon them. Fate is the magnetic pull of our souls toward the people, places, and things we belong with. Fate is just another word for people's choices coming to a head. The destiny, coincidence, whatever you name it, it's an, it inevitably lies in our own hands. I have a twisted view on fate. It's really complicated. I could have an entire discussion just on my view of fate. Let's talk about Loring for a minute. Um, Loring as a character, when we were first introduced to him, I thought, all right, cool, that's sure. Uh, and then we find out a little bit of his history. We know that he is Doug's son, and we then find out that the night that Eliza spoke with Doug, he was supposed to be meeting with his son. And because he never showed up is why Eliza and Doug talked for so long. And if he had shown up, he would have met Eliza then. And you know what? They probably would have been. And I mean, I don't even know whether Eliza really truly loved Loring. I was angry with her, honestly, just because I feel like, again, she could have handled it a different way to get him to go. She could have said, no, it's just out of the question. I'm going to stay. And maybe she went through that. I remember her going through it mentally, but just a more forceful way of making that happen instead of, you know, lying to him and could have led to his suicide. Anyway, my whole point is that maybe it could have been handled differently on her part. But I, again, I kind of like that both of these characters, you could have done this very differently. Faking your death, something else could have happened. Trying to trick Paul into believing that she and Loring were having an affair because that was one of his fears and playing on that could have also been handled differently, but I really do appreciate that these characters make wrong choices because it makes them very human, and we make wrong choices all the fucking time. I talked a lot about the deeper stuff in this story and, you know, the kind of melancholy things, but this book was really funny. What was the F train quote? I gotta find that. I laughed way too hard for way too long at three in the morning with that. As usual, the F train took forever. I decided F stood for fucking slow ass crowded fucking chug-a-lug train. <laughs> Another funny part is this. Fieldman appeared out of nowhere, fed me one of those you forgot star written all over you lines, and I didn't fall for it right away. My goals have nothing to do with celestial bodies. <laughs> Sorry, because the dog bumped the frame. I'll try to move it back. Oh, another thing that Paul said that I must read that I completely agree with. I hate the connotation of the word career. It doesn't seem to truly account for the way I spend my time. It embodies all the direct opposites of my hows and whys, and most of it implies a choice, and I've never felt like I've had any choice. Yes. And to kind of go a little bit more into what Paul's saying, I swear I've pretty much quoted everything he said. But there is this one part that I know you remember because the AK-47, he said how sh you didn't break my heart to Eliza. He said, you took an AK-47 and blew my soul open. 
it feels so much deeper and I know that was the intention and it just works so well in so many ways and I cannot give this book enough justice and I really feel like I'm not doing that. I have the most difficult time explaining every little small nuance of the book that I, I love. I have a very hard time articulating it. I'm a much better writer than I am a speaker, which may not make sense to you guys because of the YouTube thing, but I'm a much better writer because <laughs> I have time to think about it and say, no, I could have said that better. So I just, I hope I'm doing okay. I have this quite funny note. Again, this was very late when I was reading the book and I was bawling and ugh, I was a mess. <laughs> I wrote, you have got to be kidding me. All these assholes written on it. I don't believe in these little fuck nuggets. Three in the morning, me. Oh, something. This is the really important thing that I wanted to bring up that I feel like a couple people who were wishy-washy about the book may not have, I don't know, put this together or thought about it so much. I don't know. I really accepted the ending and I remember why now. I have a visitor. So I really accepted the ending because Paul was often not necessarily compared to Jesus, but they were brought up in the same sentence a lot and the whole save the savior thing and it just, it really, it felt right. And okay, I know you get bored. Yeah, don't make noise or sound like an alien cat again. He goes, she goes, that's her meow. So you'll probably hear that a few times. Back to the point. When she found out that Paul was alive, there was something that was said that it's not every day that someone you know is resurrected. And I really felt like that tied back into the Jesus thing and it just, it fit for me because of that. I, I better end this because I have every freaking animal in my house, in my room now, and they have clickety click claws and I have hardwood floors. And she's back. What are you doing? I really enjoyed this book. Again, I don't feel like I did it enough justice, but I loved the shit out of this thing. So I will see you guys later next time on Bookworms Talk. Please tell me some of your favorite parts and your favorite quotes because this thing is one of the most quoted things. It's easily my most highlighted book, aside from one that's 800 pages long, but like regular size book, easily most highlighted. I loved this thing. So I will see you guys later next time on Bookworms Talk. Bye. Not again. I know my nose smells so good. I'm just gonna keep the camera rolling because you're being very cute. What are you doing? He's looking at my books. Hmm? Is that interesting to you?